you decide you want to stop smoking. And you have every desire to stop smoking. And you really believe there's nothing in you that does not want to stop smoking. Until you try to stop smoking. And then you know the struggles. You cannot believe the indiscipline and almost the self-destructive urge that comes upon you and makes you want to have another cigarette or have another pipe or another cigar, whatever it does to you, whether it burns up your lungs or whether it shortens your life or whether it leaves your wife and your children destitute, you want to smoke. It's the same with the alcohol. I don't know how many of you have thrown out of the car window how many bottles of whiskey, half empty, and resolved that you would never buy another one. And yet there's something in you that seems to act almost in direct opposition to what your best desires are. And most of us, even those of us who aren't concerned with specific habits like smoking or drinking or drug addiction or whatever, most of us know so well that side of our natures that seems to oppose everything that our good side wants. What we've been talking about is the explanation of that. And you remember we tied it down to two attitudes to life. Uh, one attitude is that uh, there is nobody behind this universe at all. It's just the product of time plus chance. And there is no creator anywhere near, and we're on our own. And of course, that produces in itself tremendous neuroses. If we're only one of four billion, then we have to scramble for ourselves. And that brings great angst into anybody when you realize that it's you against four billion for whatever food, shelter, and clothing you need in order to survive. And all the while you know that finally you won't survive. Finally you'll die like everybody else and be buried like a dog. And so that produces a tremendous fear inside, a despair, but above all, great greed, covetousness, and selfish ambition and a desire to wipe everybody out of the way in order to get what you need. It's the same with the whole preoccupation with your own value or self-will, because you know you're unique, you know you're different from everybody else. You are. There's nobody quite like you in the universe. There never has been. There never will be. But all the other four billion think the same. And so all of us are striving to be uno, numero uno. We're all trying to be number one. We're all trying to make everybody else see how uniquely different we are from them. And that means a great deal of envy, a great deal of striving, a great deal of uh, struggling for praise and for acknowledgement and for recognition, and a great deal of resentment at people who criticize us or who put us down. So all that attitude that is based on the fact or on the idea that there is no creator and that we're on our own that creates those strong, selfish urges inside our nature that we are not able to control. On the other hand, if you have the attitude that there is a creator who actually not only made you, but knows you intimately and has counted the hair of your head, knows your name, knows why he put you here, has a job for you to do while you're here, and is going to do, as his son promised, add everything else onto you that you need, then, of course, that brings great trust and restfulness inside your own nature, a great deal of a generous attitude because you have time to look after everybody else because you know he'll look after you. And that produces that good side of your nature. Now, what we have been saying is understanding the two sides of your nature and being able to explain them both simply makes the situation worse because it doesn't change anything. All of us have found the impotence of knowledge. It is not enough to know the truth and then we'll see it. We won't like the truth when we see it. We have often had the truth explained to us, and we still don't like it, and we rebel against it, because there's something in our nature that has been bred into us down through the generations. And that's the real reason for our problem. The difficulty you have controlling your temper is not just because it's your temper, because, but because it's a temper that has been bred into the race down through the centuries, because from the beginning of time, some men and women have lived as if there's no God and have bred that into their children and bred the angst into their children and into their children's children until for centuries and centuries and centuries we have had bred into us a selfish, 
insecure nature that is now resident inside you. And what we have been saying is that there's no one that can change that except one. You certainly can't change it. What you're trying to do is change generations of people because you're the result of generations of breathing. The only thing to do with a fault that uh, begins to occur inside a manufacturing process is to recall all the products that are flawed. That is, the manufacturer has to bring them all back to the factory, has to destroy them all, and remake them completely. And that's exactly what happened with us. Before you were ever created, before you were ever made, when you were, as they say, a twinkle in your father's eye, but more than that, when you were a twinkle in God's own eye, the moment he conceived of you, he is an infinite being, brighter than Einstein, able to conceive more precisely than Einstein the unique one-moment present now nature of time and space. And the creator, in one second, conceived of you. In the second second, if you can talk about his mind even working sequentially like that, in the second second he conceived that you would live independent of him and would not trust him. In the third second he conceived that that would breed in you a nature of selfishness and insecurity that would be such a strong tendency within you that you would not be able to resist it. And in the third second he conceived of the need to destroy you and to recreate you new and whole as he had originally made you. That's what the Creator did. He did that in his Son, Jesus. That explains that incredible verse that I mentioned to you several weeks ago. It occurs in that old book, the Bible, that really probably you haven't read for a long time, and it's in the last book of the Bible. And it's uh, in a book called Revelation, it is. You've probably heard of it. And it's in chapter 13. And if you have a Bible, you should look it up sometime. And it's in verse 8. And verse 8 reads, Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb that was slain. And that's the Revised Standard Version. It's a certain translation. But actually, it's not true to the Greek. The Greek actually places the adverbial phrase of time in a different position in the sentence. And the sentence should read the way it reads in the old-fashioned King James Version of the Bible. Everyone whose name has not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, the Lamb, Jesus, was slain before the foundation of the world. You were destroyed in him before the foundation of the world and you were made new in him before the foundation of the world. If you say impossible, no, not impossible. Because time is only an accommodation that God allows us to experience so that we could live in this material world. There is actually no such thing as time, and you know it yourself. If I ask you, can you remember what happened 20 years ago, and can you remember what happened yesterday, you know that some of the things that happened 20 years ago are as vivid to you as the things that happened yesterday. Time really doesn't exist. You know again and again, you say, I can't believe the time has passed, and you can't. When things are going well on a holiday, time goes quickly. When things are going badly on a Monday morning, time goes slowly. Time is only a relative thing. There is no such thing as time. We are living in one great eternal present moment, one great now. And that's the way the Creator sees it, so that He is able to conceive of all this in a moment, and make it all take place in a moment. And then he gives us time to live it out and express it outwardly. So that all of us have come into this world with actually only one nature that is real. The good, true, unselfish nature that we were given in our recreation in Jesus. And that nature is the one that is real. The one that is unreal is the one that so many of us have been living in during this life. And the Creator arranged it that way. He arranged it that way so that we would have a real choice, so that we would be able to exercise our free wills, not only exercising them in faith, but exercising them by almost sight, knowing the two consequences of the two choices. It was like him saying to us, Now look, if you live as if I don't exist, 
If you simply ignore me and reject me and live as if you alone are the God of this world, then the kind of life that will result is the one that you are living now, where things like anger and envy and jealousy and pride will overcome you constantly. On the other hand, if you live as if I really do exist, trusting me and depending on me, this is the nature that I have given you in my Son. And this nature is yours the moment you believe it. And that is the meaning of this death of Jesus. There's a verse in this old book called the Bible that puts it very clearly. It's found in a book called Romans, Romans 6 and verse 6. And it runs, Our old self was crucified with Christ. Our old self was destroyed with Jesus. Let's talk about that a little more tomorrow.